Sometimes a wrestler looks like they're just made for the big time, like as soon as things fall into place the way they should, then there's nothing that can stop them from being a megastar. And while on most occasions, this leads to people becoming the top talent everyone believed they could and should be, other times it just never really works out for one reason or another. And that latter group is the one we're going to be looking at today then, because while they have never quite reached the top of the card, their efforts deserve to be recognized nonetheless. So join us as we do a deep dive into it all right now in Almost Famous, Wrestlers Who Were Nearly Huge Stars. And if we're going to start somewhere, let's take it back to the period where it felt like anyone who had it in them couldn't fail to be a big star. That's right, it was during the heights of the Attitude Era, where the likes of Steve Austin and The Rock were riding high, that Test would stake his claim at being the company's next big star. Of course, given his size and physique, it should have come as no surprise that Vince McMahon saw a lot in the Canadian too, and that was why, after signing him up to a contract in 1998, he'd place him in the corporation alongside the likes of The Rock and the Big Boss Man, this allowing the rookie to learn from some of the best while he was on the road during those days. And learn he certainly did, as come mid-1999, impressed with his progress, the boss would put Test into his first big program, a romance angle with his own daughter, Stephanie McMahon. Yes, it was a high-profile role which instantly shot the newcomer up the card as, now, not only was he regularly getting to show what he could do in the ring, but he was also getting to do the same in backstage segments and on the mic. Unfortunately, though, these two elements were never the strength of Test's game, and with that now being exposed to a large audience, perhaps the boss was right to get second thoughts, as by December of 99, Test would have been usurped in the role of Stephanie's lover by Triple H. After that, then, he would start to slip down the card, with him eventually falling into a tag team role with Albert that would be most memorable for introducing WWF audiences to Trish Stratus. Then once that ran its course, the Canadian would find some more singles success when, over the next few years, he'd become a hardcore champion, a tag team champion, and an intercontinental champion. That said, his star would never rise beyond the mid-card again, and so, in 2004, after feeling like they'd done all they could do with him, the company would release him from his contract. And he wouldn't be the only star who was once supposed to reach the top that would end up getting released either, as around about the same time that Test was getting started with WWF, Dr. Death Steve Williams was having a spectacular fall from grace. This one, though, was all the worse for the fact that Williams had proven himself to be a superstar in other places prior to this, with his early days on both the gridiron and the amateur wrestling scene finding him much success. Then, when he left the world of each of these behind, he'd find even greater acclaim in the pro wrestling ring, as in both World Championship Wrestling and All Japan Pro Wrestling, he'd fully earned the moniker of Dr. Death, one of the most feared heels on either roster. That was why, as one of his biggest fans, Jim Ross would continually push for Williams to be signed up to WWF in the late 90s, with good old JR firmly believing that he had it in him to be a top guy in New York, too. So, acquiescing to this, Vince McMahon would sign the former four-time All-American in 1998, believing here that if he put him in a shoot fight scenario, then it would immediately sell him as a legitimate threat to the audience. Enter the Brawl for All, one of the worst ideas in wrestling history, where after putting a series of performers into real fights on TV, the company would end up having to deal with a number of injuries, all while simultaneously having to repair the damage done to the credibility of anyone who lost these fights. And no one's credibility was hurt worse than Steve Williams as it happened, because upon being knocked out by eventual winner Bart Gunn in the second round, his aura would be flushed away before he could hit the mat. After that, any plans WWF had to put him in a program with Steve Austin were nixed, as with fans no longer seeing Dr. Death as legitimate, he'd sink down to the Hardcore division, there feuding with the likes of Hardcore Holly and Tiger Ali Singh for a while, all before he was eventually released from his contract in 1999. Yes, it was a sad end for Steve Williams' time in WWF, but after the debacle that was the brawl for all, there really was no saving things. At least he got to have another run out east after this, though, because a couple of decades later when Jason Jordan's run came to a close, he wouldn't be so lucky. No, instead, he would be taken out by an unfortunate career-ending injury right as he was hitting his prime. Of course, prior to that though, the former NCAA athlete was being groomed for great things by Vince McMahon, as after joining WWE in 2011, he'd be sent to their developmental territories in order to gain some seasoning before finally hitting the big time. 
and during this time, he would end up forming an alliance with former Olympic athlete Chad Gable, with the two men's skills in amateur wrestling drawing them together and leading them to become American Alpha. After that, they'd reign as one of the highlights of NXT over the next few years, where alongside DIY and The Revival, they'd put on some of the best tag team matches the company had seen in years. That said, upon reaching the main roster in 2016, things would begin to falter as, with Vince McMahon seemingly having limited interest in tag team wrestling, American Alpha would have to fight to be seen at all. So maybe it was for the best then that the following year, the duo would quietly split up, with Jordan at this point being revealed as the kayfabe secret son of Kurt Angle. Yes, this was just the break that the former tag team champion had been looking for, because now getting the big singles push with a legend in his corner, it seemed like only a matter of time before he reached the main event scene. And that was what made it all the sadder when, upon getting into a program with Seth Rollins not long after this, a program that saw the two briefly win tag team gold together, Jordan would suffer a neck injury which, while initially appearing to be healable in time for WrestleMania, turned out to be so bad that he was forced to retire from in-ring competition altogether. That's right, just like that, it was over, and the push that the company had planned for him would never come to fruition. So really, it just goes to act as a reminder that while the whole thing is scripted, wrestling is often a very dangerous activity, with the performers usually only half an inch away from disaster. When it comes to our next entry though, we can hardly blame his failure to become a star on injury, because in the case of Wade Barrett, it was the booking team that ultimately did a number on his chances instead. Before the pencil could get him though, the Englishman had a bright future ahead of him, as upon spending some time in NXT during its game show format in early 2010, he'd invade the main roster that summer as the leader of the Nexus, a collective of performers who'd gotten tired of waiting around in developmental and had chosen to band together and take over the company instead. And as the leader of the group, Barrett was being positioned as the next big thing from the get-go. Unfortunately though, his momentum would be stalled when, at that year's SummerSlam, the Nexus were well and truly destroyed during their 7-on-7 tag team match against Team WWE, with John Cena pretty much nerfing them all single-handedly come the close. Still, it wasn't the end of the road for Barrett quite yet, because after that, he'd move into a singles feud with Big Match John, one which looked like it might establish him as the company's next top star after all. But while this could have worked if he'd come out on top, it would ultimately only cause more damage in the long term because during their final bout at December's tables, ladders, and chairs, the Nexus leader would quite literally get buried under a mountain of steel chairs. After that, the damage was done, and any initial plans the company had for Barrett to end The Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania 28 were scrapped, when the Englishman instead became a fixture of the Intercontinental title scene over the next couple of years all up until the point that he'd reinvent himself as Bad News Barrett in 2013. And while this reinvention still wouldn't take him to the top of the card, it would secure him a spot for a while yet. It's just a shame that the same can't be said for our next entry then because when Tom McGee flopped, there were no second chances coming his way. But to tell his story, we'll need to ask you all to cast your minds all the way back to 1986. There, WWF is right in the middle of its first boom period, making wrestling the coolest thing on the playground and Hulk Hogan a pop culture superstar. That said, even by this point, Vince McMahon had one eye to the future, and so realizing that the Hulkster couldn't go on forever, he was already looking for his replacement. Enter Tom McGee, a former powerlifter and bodybuilder who, after deciding to enter the world of pro wrestling, would get a tryout match in New York later that year. And luckily for him, he would be entering the ring with Bret Hart, arguably the greatest wrestler of all time during this tryout, with the hitman taking such pride in his abilities to make others look like a million dollars at this point that he would repeatedly promise McGee that he was going to get a job after their bout that night. So, true to his word then, Hart took what limited skills the rookie had in the ring and crafted a match around them which made him look like a superstar, with this ending up being so impressive that word quickly got back to Vince McMahon. And taking a look at the tape from there, the boss would believe McGee had everything he was looking for in his next top star, something which led him to making initial plans to push the rookie as his next top babyface. Unfortunately though, it soon became clear that not all of the former bodybuilder's opponents were as good as the hitman, and so, after being exposed as just a competent wrestler who needed far more training in subsequent bouts, McMahon decided to scrap the push, with him instead trying and ultimately failing to build his next Hulk Hogan in The Ultimate Warrior. 
and that was how, in 1986, Tom McGee almost became the face of WWF. In fact, had all of his opponents been up to the caliber of Hart, he likely would have. As for the match that almost made him, though, well, that would go on missing for years after, allowing it to become something of a holy grail for wrestling fans who wanted to see just what the hell Bret had done to make his opponent look so good that night. Then in 2019, this tape would finally be rediscovered, letting people see for the first time why the boss's attention had been grabbed so easily. Of course, in later years, though, it would be much harder to get McMahon's attention as, with his view of what a star could be becoming increasingly narrowed with age, even people who got wildly over would struggle to receive his stamp of approval, a fact that Rusev can personally attest to. Yes, despite initially seeming to gain favor with the boss upon debuting on the main roster in 2014 as the Bulgarian Brute, a heel monster in the vein of Ivan Drago from Rocky IV, things would begin to falter for Rusev when, after sinking into more of a mid-card role in the years that followed, he would lose much of the momentum that got him over. Luckily for him, however, he was insanely talented, and so after spending some time trying to come up with something new, he would begin developing Rusev Day in 2017 a gimmick which quickly saw him reach even greater levels of popularity than he had before, this time as a babyface. That said, while fans were now getting behind him in waves, McMahon didn't quite see things the same way, with him reportedly telling Rusev around this time that the crowd chants of Rusev Day weren't a sign that they loved him, they were a sign that they were mocking him. How he came to this conclusion, we're not sure, but what we can be sure of is that if given the ball to run with at this point, there's no doubt the Bulgarian native would have been a top guy. In the end, though, he would continue to mill around in the mid-card up until his release in 2020, at which point he would prove he always had it in him when he jumped to All Elite Wrestling and reinvented himself once more as Miro, the redeemer and feared monster of the entire babyface roster. Yes, Miro's run in AEW has been a successful one thus far, it's just a shame that his time in WWE didn't go as well as it could have. Of course, when it comes to wrestlers in similar situations, a few years prior to this, there was a performer that was given the initial chance to be placed in the main event, and that was Ryback. Yes, there was a brief window where Ryback could have been a huge deal in early 2010's WWE, as with his Goldberg-esque presentation and natural charisma, it seemed like an easy home run. And for him, it really all got started back in 2011 when, following a short run in the Nexus, Skip Sheffield would morph into his better-known incarnation, from there starting a winning streak that would quickly get him over with fans. In fact, over the following few months, he would rack up a full 38 victories, with all this leading to him facing then-WWE Champion CM Punk inside of Hell in a Cell at that October's titular pay-per-view. That said, given the fact that Punk was on an impressive run of his own at this point, many felt it was too soon to make this match, and at the end of the day, somebody was going to have to lose, and it was going to hurt their momentum before it was necessary. Still, with John Cena out injured at the time, WWE felt they had no choice but to pull the trigger on the bout. And that was how, after just over 11 minutes, the big guy's undefeated streak came to a swift end. From there, while he would remain popular, he would never have that same level of momentum, something which was reflected in his spot on the card, as instead of dominating the main event following this, Ryback would slip down into something of an upper mid-card role. Then, when even that failed to maintain enough popularity with fans, he would slip down further as he became a lower mid-card tag team act with Curtis Axel, with even Paul Heyman not being able to revive his career at this point. Not that it was all bad, of course, he would win the Intercontinental title in October of 2014, but by then, that belt meant so little, he might as well not have won it at all. And he wasn't the only person whose fortunes ultimately wouldn't be changed by winning a belt because, despite having a hardcore title run way back in the early 2000s, Maven would also fail to reach that next level. Of course, when it comes to him though, this was far from the most notable part of his story, as alongside his female parallel Nydia, Maven made history in 2001 when he became the winner of the first series of Tough Enough, a reality show designed to find the next top WWF prospect. And while he was certainly deserving of the victory, in the end, the fact that he'd gained his spot on the roster through such unconventional means would inevitably lead to a lot of heat coming his way once he joined the main roster later that year. So needing to prove himself, the rookie would work extra hard, effectively being forced to learn in front of a worldwide audience, as after only getting a few months in developmental, he'd be put right into the limelight when he entered into a brief feud with Taz. 
Yes, it was clear WWF had big plans for the newcomer, but despite his best efforts, as the weeks and months went on, it became clear that, while there was a lot of raw potential in Maven, he just wasn't ready for the big time yet. And to be fair to him, how could he be? He hadn't had enough time to get ready after all. Still, it wouldn't stop him from getting a notable moment in the 2002 Royal Rumble when a well-placed dropkick saw him eliminate The Undertaker, causing a stunned live crowd to briefly get behind him in full. After that, he'd even score a victory over the dead man on the February 7th episode of SmackDown that year, taking his hardcore title away from him in the process. Then, as if this wasn't enough, the company would further try to capitalize on his momentum by having the rookie get into a feud with Evolution a while later, with him even getting a pinfall victory over Dave Batista at one point. That, however, would prove to be his high point as part of the WWF roster because, from there, he would largely sink back down to the mid-card, having feuds with the likes of Shelton Benjamin and Eugene, all up until the point that he was released from his contract in 2005. At least when it came to Maven, though, there was a brief point where it really felt like he could have become a top star, because with our next entry, Alex Riley, that moment would never really materialize. Still, there were attempts to get him to the next level throughout his run between 2010 and 2016 as, after coming to the main roster as the protege of The Miz, Riley would end up drawing the ire of John Cena, with all this leading to the two squaring off one-on-one -on -one in a steel cage match during the February 28, 2011 episode of Raw. And while for most, this would have been represented as a major upward move in their career, for the rookie, it would end up being his death knell, at least if you believe him, that is. Yes, according to Riley, Big Match John would see so little in his future that after the match, he would voice his disapproval to Vince McMahon, with this leading to the newcomer being demoted back down to developmental. And although he would eventually return to the main roster later that year, things would never be the same. As now firmly rooted in the mid-card, he wouldn't get much to do other than a brief feud with The Miz once the two broke up and went their separate ways. In fact, so bad would things get that by 2013, frustrated with his lack of in-ring success, Alex Riley would choose to hang up his boots altogether, with him instead moving over to the commentary booth at this point. But even that wouldn't be an option for our last entry, because after a short run and the early 2000s TNA roster, Monty Brown would be gone from the company altogether. Of course, it's not hard to see why TNA thought they had a star in Monty, as being a former football player with an impressive physique and natural athletic skill, it seemed like he was tailor-made for that era of wrestling. Unfortunately, though, despite attempting to rocket him to the main event scene by programming him with Jeff Jarrett early on in his run, TNA would see things begin to stall soon thereafter, leading to the rookie turning heel and becoming a member of Jarrett's stable instead. Then, once that ran its course, Brown would get a second attempt at reaching the next level when he turned babyface again and began going after the then NWA World Heavyweight Champion Christian Cage for a while. That said, in the end, these efforts would fail too, and by May of 2006, he would have parted ways with the company, with him from there jumping over to WWE to have a short run on the revived ECW brand. Ultimately, though, Brown would decide to retire early from professional wrestling due to personal family issues and never returned, leading to him becoming one of the biggest what-if stories in wrestling history. As for us, however, that's where we'll leave it for today, because despite there being countless other examples out there, we feel that this represents some of the most noteworthy times a wrestler came in with all the potential in the world and ultimately failed to reach the next level. And while it's easy to throw blame around for why this happened in each case, it's important to remember that for the most part, even if they never hit it as big as they hoped they might, they were still able to get a nice career out of the situation, meaning they can't really be considered failures. However, that doesn't stop us from wondering what could have been. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.